Nigeria's main opposition party, the People's Democratic Party, will be led into next year's general election by former Vice President Atiku Abubakar, who recently won the party's presidential ticket to contest for a position he has been angling for for more than 30 years. How prepared is he this time after coming a relatively distant second in 2019 against the incumbent President Muhammadu Buhari of the All Progressives Congress? Will PDP's decision to do away with zoning come back to bite his behind, especially in the southeast geopolitical zone, where it had enjoyed close to 100% support at a point? Will Atiku Abubakar's choice of Delta State Governor Ifani Okoa as a running mate be enough to secure the southeast and the party's seemingly current stronghold in the south-south? A lot of questions, and for a bit of help with all of that, we are now being joined by Majid Dahiru, a journalist, newspaper columnist and entrepreneur who has written so many critical pieces on the People's Democratic Party. Good morning, Dairo. Good to have you join us. Good morning. Good, good, good to morning. be here too. <laughs> good morning. Um, I know your position on PDP and the question of zoning. Uh, first that I'd like to ask you is, are you disappointed uh, that PDP uh, eventually, you know, jettisoned the idea of zoning that is, you know, um, entrenched in his own constitution. And how do you think that the Atiku and the Okoa combination uh, will pose a threat uh, to the APC? And do you think that Okoa, uh, as an Ifai, uh, will pacify the Saudis' voters as an Igbo person? He has said it himself that he's an Igbo man living in South South. Do you think that that will be sufficient? Uh, to appeal uh, to the Southeast uh, voters? First, on the issue of zoning, if I say I'm disappointed, uh, it will be actually understating the fact because as an opposition party, the PDP is expected to be a beacon of morality. The PDP is supposed to be that party, more than any other party, that's supposed to uphold the principles of equity, fairness, and justice as an opposition party. Because they're supposed to be an alternative to the ruling party. And so when the PDP failed to zone its presidency to the South, as expected by not just Nigerians, but as also, as also contained in its own constitution, uh, the PDP came across as a party that is dishonorable, that lacks fidelity and commitments to agreement and is unable to obey its own simple rules of engagement. And so the PDP is starting this race on a very wrong footing. In fact, uh, the candidacy of Atiko Obakar is perceived by many across the country as forged in treachery of some sort because in 2019, the PDP as a party zoned the presidency to the north. And there was no southern contender for the presidency in 2019. In fact, uh, the southern flank of the party supported their preferred candidates from the north. And we saw what played out at the Court Convention when Governor Newsom Wiki, for example, gave all he could to see to the emergence of uh, Governor Aminu uh, Waziri Tambuwal. And we also saw how uh, leaders of the party from other parts of the country also gave in their support to see to the emergence of um, Atiku Abakar, who, em who eventually emerged as the candidate. And so it was a very fair contest then that was devoid of any form of acrimony because it was equitably done and it was also fairly done to favor the North that has been disfavored by the same PDP in 2015. So it was expected that by 2019, the reverse. Uh, would have happened, it would have been one turn, one good turn deserving another for the northern flank of the PDP to have also supported uh, their preferred candidates in the just concluded presidential primaries uh, from the south. But unfortunately, we didn't see that. We saw the northern flank of the PDP coming into the race strongly, and we saw Aminu Waziri Tambua, who was supported by Wiki, Governor Wiki, in 2019 stepping down for a fellow northerner, fellow Muslim, and a fellow Hausa speaking Fulani man to deny a southerner the ticket of the PDP. And this was done in such a brazen manner, citing with ability 
And so a lot of frayed nerves are out there in the PDP strongest hold, mm. which happens to be the southern part of this country, particularly the southeast and the south-south, and of course the middle belt areas of Nigeria. And so this particular decision to jettison zoning is already its advantage for the PDP because the northern wing of the APC has shown more honor. In fact, they demonstrated the highest level of honor, given the fact that they hold the yab and the knife going into this race. They have the population and they have the power of incumbency. Yet, the northern element in the APC decided to tow the path of honor. And they did the very right thing for the country. They showed commitment to the unity of this country and fidelity to the principles of equity, fairness, and justice. When they decided, against all odds, to zone the presidential seat to the south within their own party, and they made sure they worked for the badges of a southern candidate in their party. And like I've said severally, the northern establishment is actually committed to power shift because it's not in the character of the northern political culture to do things that are dishonorable, that do not serve the purpose of equity and fairness. In, if you go through history, it's, 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 a, it's an established fact that at all times they have tried to demonstrate, you know, a commitment to equity and fairness. They did it in 1999, they did it in 2007, and in 2023 they are committed to doing the same thing. And unfortunately, the PDP people didn't read the tea leaves properly when they decided to throw it open and allow the North to have it going into this race. So as we speak, the North has lost, the, the PDP bit has lost its most secure support base in the Southeast and the South-South, oh. especially with the emergence of Mr. Peter Obi on the platform of the Liberal Party. And so, the, yes, Okowa is a very decent, extraordinarily gentleman that is a proper fit for the position of a vice president. But a lot more needs to be done to win back that base. And we don't see that happening yet. So it's not enough to pick an Okua who's an Igbo speaking Nigerian from the South South. That is not even the question. The question is why would a Northern politician, somebody who's supposed to be a statesman, who's supposed to be supporting the South, a Southern candidate in his own party, as we have seen the Northern uh, politicians in the APC do to their Southern counterparts, coming to take the ticket of the PDP at a time that presidency is supposed to be going to the South? So it's something that needs to be worked on. And I do not know how they're going to go about it. So it's not the responsibility of Okowa in this instance to win back support for the PDP from the strongest base of the South, South and Southeast. It is the candidate of the party that needs to go into that zone and have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation if indeed he's really ready to, you know, put up a good showing in this race. So as it stands today, the Labour Party candidate, Mr. Peter B, has taken over the support base of the PDP in the Southeast and the South, South substantially. And so, the PDP stands the risk of running against, of selling against the wind and capsizing in the 2023 election because it is likely to lose much of its support in the South. And the Northern Element in APC have made a firm commitment to mobilize voters in that region for their preferred candidate in the South, who happens to be the former governor of Lagos State. And so even the North is not secure for the Northern candidate of the PDP because there is a commitment across the country for power to shift to the South for the purpose of equity, fairness and justice in order to preserve the unity of this country. All right. Well, I get your point. You know, you're saying it's not enough for Okowa, who is a Southeasterner, to have been picked as Atiku's running mate. Now, I'd like your assessment of the claim by some Southeastern and Middle Belt leaders who say that Governor Ifanyi Okowa betrayed the clamor for presidential power to return to the South in 2023, given that Okowa at a point hosted the Southern Governors Forum on, issue, on the issue of zoning uh, the presidency to the South. I, that is one of the uh, impression out there that Governor Koa and his principal, former Vice President Atiku Abaka, will have to really work hard to actually overturn. Because indeed, Okua hosted the historic Asaba Declaration meeting, where the 17 Southern governors assembled to say, look, we want power to shift to the South in 2023. And that declaration was supported by the leading sociocultural groups in the South, 
I'm not talking about the Pandev, Afeni Ferry, or Haneze, and the Middlebet Forum. And in fact, at the point, uh, these social cultural groups came together and said, okay, not just the southern part of Nigeria should have the presidency, but the south is specifically. And for Okowa to have emerged as running mate to Atiko Abakar at a time that the south is desirous of the office of the presidency, and the north is even willing, as we've seen in the APC, to actually work for power shift to the south, yes, you cannot actually fault those that are claiming that maybe some form of betrayal may have happened. But knowing Okowa as much as I do, and having listened to him after his emergence as vice president, he's simply trying to fill uh, a void that has been created by the PDP when they zone power to the south, uh, to the north, I mean, and expectedly the vice president must come from the south. And Okowa happens to be uh, the most suitable for the position of vice president. And he has, you know, some level of personal qualities, the discipline he brings to bear in his political transactions, you know, sets him apart as somebody who can easily galvanize some form of consensus support among the leaders of the PDP in order to complement the strength that you might bring into this ticket. But again, a lot of negotiations now must be undertaken. It's not enough to say I'm not a betrayer. It is for the presidential candidate of the APC, of the PDP, to lead a process of reconciliation now with the leaders of Pandev, Ohaneze, Afeni Ferry, and the Middlebird Forum, because these people represent the zones in Nigeria that have been the most consistent support base of the PDP. And so, Atiku Abakar, and not even Okoa, must lead the process of reconciliation and rapprochement with these people if they ever hope to make a good showing in this election. And the earlier the better, because time is actually not their friend in this instance. So yes, the, the, the leaders of the South and the Middle Belt, yes, cannot be faulted for saying Okua betrayed them, because indeed, he hosted the Asaba declaration. Okay. He did. You know, and when governors like uh, Wiki came out, actually, and when a governor like Wiki came out to struggle for the ticket, when people like Peter B from the South also came out to contest for the ticket of the PDP. And when you have a governor like Governor Kredolu, who consistently at every point was intervening through well written press statements to the authorities that look, you cannot jettison zoning in the APC, at least the party that he belongs to. And even when the, governor, the, the chairman of the APC made that attempt to bring up another now as a consensus candidate, you saw the quick response from Governor Kredolu. So, what I'm saying in essence is, we saw the commitment of other southern governors towards power shift across party lines. We didn't see much of that from Okowa. And that is why people are now accusing him of being a betrayer. But again, I said, Okowa is a very decent man. I do not think he's a betrayer. But he needs to do more with his principal to convince their support base that he is not a betrayer of the cause of power shift. And it happened in spite of his own effort uh, to make sure that power shift to the south. That might be a bit more soothing and comforting for the people of the southern part of this country and the Middle Belt. Now, to follow up on that note, you know, Okoa had said in an interview last week that he aligned himself with the PDP's decision to throw its presidential race open for all zones in the country to test their strength um, in the primary election. You know, that's as the Southern and Middle Belt uh, forum leaders were pushing for the zoning of the presidency to the South. Now, if you were to assess his candidacy, how would you rate his credibility with his, uh, you know, recent emergence? Okua is a very credible uh, candidate for the vice presidency of not just the PDP ticket, but even for Nigeria. He's a decent man. He's a very, very disciplined individual, a medical doctor of high repute. And he has the experience, both legislative and executive experience, to actually complement a presidential ticket. And you see, you need to have a vice, a vice presidential candidate that can actually be a president. And uh, Okowa, in my opinion, is a, is a proper fit for the office of the president. And so that makes his vice presidential candidate quite commendable and viable in any case. But the strength he brings to the table is, is a different ball game entirely. He may not be able to do much in a region that is desirous of power shift. And you have the APC flying uh, a southerner from the southern part of this country who has a lot of influence in the south-south as well. 
are the middle best parts of this country. And I'm talking about Asuraju and Bonatinibu. And of course, you also have a very formidable and very popular candidate from the South that is flying the flag of the Labour Party, who has actually inspired a democratic awakening in Nigeria today. I call it the Obimania that we are witnessing today, where every young man and woman is filing to the nearest registration point to get the PVC in order to vote for a candidate they think has what it takes to meet the leadership need of this country going forward. And so you have this contenders from the South. And so the South may not want to settle for vice presidency, I mean, a second fiddle position when they have options in these two other Southern candidates. And so this, that is the challenge. And, and, and again, I want to say the PDP didn't do well when they threw open the contest for the presidency. Knowing that their strongest support base is actually the South, should have done the needful by zoning it to the South. And we would have saved ourselves all of this buhaha. In fact, Okowa should have been given the ticket of the, president, of the presidential uh, uh, flag of the PDP. Okowa is fit. I would have made more political mileage as the candidate of the APC, of the PDP, rather than being a vice presidential candidate. Because he has all it takes to pilot the affairs of Nigeria, having governed a complex state like Delta, that is one of the most diverse states in Nigeria in the last seven years. And so Okwa would have even done better as a presidential candidate in line with the Sabah declaration rather than a vice presidential candidate. But in any case, the PDP must have a vice presidential candidate. And since the candidate is from the north, especially we from the south. So Okwa is a good material for vice presidency. And in fact, it's a good material for presidency. However, a lot needs to be done to reconcile the Okwa article ticket to their support base in the south and in the middle belt. And if this is not done, this region, they, they have an alternative now in the APC candidate and the Labour Party candidate. So a lot of work needs to put in at this point to see if certain guarantees can be made, certain compromises can be made between the Okowa article ticket and the people of the southern part of this country and the middle belt, who have consistently supported the PDP since 1999. Yeah, but Majid, I, I'm wondering if you... Um, appreciate in any manner the sort of calculations that might be going on within the PDP, because you seem to put a lot of emphasis uh, on the strength uh, and the commitment that the uh, Southeast, out of the you know three zones from the from the South, you know, has given to uh, the PDP. But then the map, the map of that region, you know, has changed politically speaking. Two states from out of the five there. Are with APC, a boy in an emo. One is with Abga. You are left with only two. Whereas in the South South, where Atiku has picked his vice presidential candidate from, is only one state that is with the APC, Cross River State. And so if you look at you know, the fine line you know, between where really can we say that we will get sufficient votes, is it not better uh, for PDP to hope that? the strength of Atiku from the north, and Anukoa from the south-south, where PDP is a lot stronger as at today than the south is, will make a lot of sense, which is why you see that there, is, there seems to be a lot of appeasement to Governor Wiki, rather than say, go to a pious Ayim in Eboyi, where his state is with the, with the APC already. How really do you think that um, um, the southeast can help the PDP because it looks like there are only two states. And in any case, the other three states will most likely share the votes between APC and the Labour Party. And therefore, I think the PDP, what they are trying to do, which you don't seem to agree with, is to concentrate on where their strength lies in the North and in the South South, with the hope that they will share the Southeast votes with the, with the APC and the Labour Party. Do you think that that, that, that that might be the kind of political calculations that they are working on? You know, you are, we have to understand something. I'm, I believe the PDP should be working towards winning the election and not just having votes from some of these places and end up not winning. Now, Okowa is the best option available for former Vice President Atiku Abaka to pick as a running mate from the South. He fits all purposes for the presidential race. However, there is something that is actually bigger than Okowa and even party membership in the South today, and it is the quest 
It is the quest for power to shift to the south after eight years of presidency in the north. And let me make you understand something, sir. If Atiku Abaka, for example, wins this election, it means for 16 years back to back, the presidency of Nigeria would have decided in the north, in the Muslim north, in the House of speaking Fulani north, at that, for 16 years. Now, what this would have done is that it would have entrenched in Nigeria a reward privilege that would be so dis difficult to dismantle going forward. Because by 2031, when uh, the uh, Atiku Abaka will be finishing his 8 year tenure as president, the question of power relations between North and South would have actually gone into extinction because it would have become a, an accepted fact that the Southerner cannot win the presidency of Nigeria and that the presidency now becomes the exclusive preserve of the Muslim North because of the winnability factor in the numbers that comes out of this region. This is what is at stake in this election. In order not to create a country where you have an apartheid system that confers privilege on a section of the country and puts a concrete ceiling on other sections that limits their aspirations to just being number two in the country of their bed, where their citizens, where their free citizens are that, is what is at stake in this election. And so the people of the South, whether they are PDP, whether they are Africa, whether they are Labour, whether they are APC, are going to be voting for equity, justice, and fairness. And we had expected the PDP to have positioned this candidacy from this region in order to benefit from this sentiment. And as I said, Okoa is a very good pick for vice presidency. But Okoa would have also made a very good presidential candidate. And so if the PDP had calculated what is at stake going into the 2023 election, they should actually made Okoa the candidate of the party rather than making him the vice presidential candidate because with the Labour Party having P2B and the APC having Bola Ahmed to move from the Southwest, you cannot convince Southerners to accept a second position when they have opportunity to have in the first position after eight years of this position being in the North. These are the naughty issues that the APDP must have to tackle going to the 2023 election. And so what we're likely to see is that with the overwhelming sentiment coming in from the South and the push for the presidency, people are going to vote outside their party, their traditional party affiliations because of the question of equity and fairness. And so you're going to see a region such as the South-South that is controlled largely by the PDP, most likely voting outside of the PDP if certain negotiations are not put in place now and guarantees among which must be a pledge for one-term presidency from Atiku Abaka and a firm written and declared commitment to probably restructure Nigeria along certain lines that are dear to the hearts of the southern part by peoples of Nigeria. A that commitment is made in bold relief that is going to be a one-term president amongst so many other commitments and compromises. The prospect of an eight-year wrong presidency in the North is one that the South is not willing to accept at this time, no matter how good that candidate is. And this has become even more imperative because the North is even willing to also support worship to the South, as demonstrated by the Northern Wing of the APC. So the PDP has a huge task ahead of it, if it must make a showing. So there's no guarantee that the dominance of PDP in the South-South will guarantee presidential votes. It happened to the, to the PDP, for example, in 2015. The PDP had a number of governors from the North. But when the issue of power shift to the North became something that was a widespread sentiment in the region, even the Northern PDP governors worked against their party in support of the region's quest for power shift to the North. And that was how President Muhammad Buhari emerged in 2015. It is a known fact that even people within the PDP structure from top to bottom worked for, a, for the emergence of a northern president against their own party candidate who was from the south. So these are the sentiments that are at play in this election. Now, if the PDP had picked a candidate from the south, yes, their strength in the south-south, in the southeast, and parts of the southwest would have come in to give them the edge against other parties that are competing with them for the presidency. But the fact that they are picking from the north 
sets them against the wind. And this is what we caution the PDP against doing in the months preceding their presidential primaries to say, look, read the mood in the country correctly. It will be difficult for you to convince your own support base to vote for another candidate against other candidates that may likely fly the flag of the APC and other parties. And we have seen two very powerful inflation and popular candidates emerge on the platform of the APC and the Labour Party. The OB candidacy have become a movement across this country. And in fact, he has practically appropriated the support base of the APC, of the PDP in the Southeast and the South South and passed for the middle belt. And so you begin to wonder, where exactly is the PDP hoping to get his votes from as it stands, except they go back to the drawing board and strategize and begin to actually make certain concrete commitments and offer to their support base. So the problem is the PDP support base is in the South. And you are not picking the okay, candidate outside Majid, of that region. Majid, sorry when to, that same region is desirous. Majid, sorry to have to cut you, but I'm just interested in the sort of deal uh, that you have mentioned, uh, a one-term presidency, and then an, a specific offer to who? To the Southeast, after a one-term uh, presidency of Atiku, or to South-South? How do, where do you find Obi in this kind of negotiation, if it is possible at all? Well, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm only suggesting yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the best possible uh -huh, ways that the PDP can actually go about this. If that offer, there's no guarantee that people will accept it. Mm. Because, again, if you go back to 2019, the basis for support for Atiku Abakar by the southern part of this country, and even the southern wing of the, AP, of the PDP then, was his earlier commitment to do one term. I remember vividly that he granted that interview to this day, you suppose, where he made the point clear that he was going to run for one term. It was in base of that one term commitment that the leaders of the South, also considering the fact that Atiku has a long standing reputation as a nationalist, as somebody who is detribalized, as somebody who has the capabilities to unite the country, at the time that the current administration is believed, widely believed, to have actually divided this country along our regular fault lines. And so that one-term commitment from Atiku was the basis of support for him at the Portacot Convention. Because it was considered that Tambu, being a younger person, who also didn't make commitments to one term, may want to go all the way for two terms and an eight-year presidency. At a time in 2023, the power was shifting to the south. And so it was strategic to support supported Atiku to run for one term, so that if, in case he emerges as president in 2019, by 2023, when power be coming to the south, he will not seek re-election. That was the understanding. And so when Atiku came out to pick form, even ahead of the decision of the zoning committee within the PDP, which clearly put that committee's work in jeopardy, are we sure the people of the south, east and south, south, we trust Atiku, even with this offer of one time again? So he has to go and sit down with the strategists to think of ingenious ways to appease this region. And it's important it's not that because the PDP is weak in the north. You see, it's not enough to pick another candidate and expect to have his votes from the north because of shared ethnicity, religion, or geography of origin. No, it doesn't work like that in the north. And that played out, for example, in the APC convention. Ahmed Lawan was propped up by certain facts, certain forces within the APC. And the North has made it clear that no, that your Northern does not guarantee automatic vote. He was beaten to fourth position in that primary election because the bulk of the stakeholders from the North in the APC opted for a Southern presidency. And they are going to make sure that their preferred candidate also gets majority of the votes from that region. Do not forget that the APC is in control of 14 out of 19 states in the North. And they are still the dominant party in the North. No matter the failure of APC, that's what people must understand. The people of the North still owe the APC that gratitude for being the party that restored power to the North in 2015. It is there. So no matter their failure, they still do not trust the, the PDP that betrayed them in 2015 by refusing to shift power to the North. So the same thing is about to be for the, the PDP in the South. The, the South is also now looking at the PDP as a party that betrayed their trust, their confidence, and their support consistently for almost 24 years when it refused to put in place every factor that would have ensured the emergence of a Southern candidate on his platform going to the 2023 election. So this is why the PDP may likely lose not only in the South, 
but may not actually win as much as we expect them to win in the North, even with the Northern presidential candidate. So the party needs to sit down and look at their ticket, look at the composition, and begin to you know, come up with ingenious strategies that can win back the support in the South, if it is possible, I do not know, but at least let them be seen to making certain effort. And time is running out. Others are consolidating. I'm aware that the APC candidate is in active communication and talks with, you know, dissatisfied PDP elements in the South, in the South, South, in the South East, including sitting governors. And so the PDP cannot take the support of the South for granted. You see, PDP is not ingrained in the DNA of Southerners. They've supported the party because the party has been fair to them. So the party today decided not to be as fair as they had expected it to be going into the 2023 race. You cannot guarantee the support of PDP in the South. And so it's not enough to pick an Okuwa, whom I have said earlier is a perfect gentleman, a fit for purpose vice presidential candidate. In fact, if you ask me, he should have gotten the ticket of the presidency on the platform of the, AP, of the PDP. It would have been easy for the PDP to have, win, to have gone, gone into this race and possibly win. But with him as the running mate, the, 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 the sentiment is, for how long I'm going to play second fiddle? For another 16 years, the South will be playing second fiddle to a northern presidential candidate for 16 years. By that time, a southern child that is 10 years today, and who would have become 18 in 2031, would have grown into a country where there is a concrete ceiling on his or her aspirations beyond the position of vice presidency. This is what people of the South and well-meaning Nigerians from the North do not want to happen in their country. Because even the Northerners understand the imperative of social justice, equity, and fairness as necessary ingredients for national unity. Because if you do not have national unity, you can't solve any of Nigeria's multifaceted challenges of insecurity and economic problems. And so the North needs national unity much more than any other part of the country today because it is the epicenter of Nigeria's insecurity earthquake. And so it is important that all half of you are there to unite this country. But again, if the PDP intends to go into this race and win, it has to sit down at this point and put on its thinking cap and begin to think of all of these uh, bottlenecks have enumerated and devise ways of overcoming them. But like I said, one of, one of the commitments will be a one-term presidency. Again, whether the South will accept that and trust Atiku once more, I do not know. Mm -hmm. But at least let them move on fight and let's see how the conversation goes. But something that must be offered. Otherwise, the PDP, the PDP might lose in the South and lose in the North, as a lot of people have predicted, you know, in the recent past. Well, all right. Uh, well, talking about uh, presidential votes, given all you have said about Atiku Abubakar's chances in the South, South, Southeast, and especially in the Southwest, as today's, uh, this day is quoting uh, former President Lucia Guobasanjo, as to have said yesterday during an awards ceremony, that one of the mistakes he has made in life was speaking former Vice President Atiku Abubakar as his running mate during the 1999 presidential election. We've also seen um, old videos surface on light of late uh, where the former president appeared to be running sort of a, a smear campaign as it relates to Atiku's uh, travel documents or alleged ban into the United States. W what do you make of all these as it relates to uh, trusting Atiku Abubakar? The, the statement by former president Olusha Gopasanjo, to me, is simply an indication of the winning support for the Atiku candidacy in the South. Do not forget that President Olusha Gopasanjo played a very pivotal role in 2019 in the, in the, in the quest for Atiku to become president. He played a very fundamental role. He not only, be, he not only became uh, the chief opposition voice to the current administration, he also mobilized behind the scene forces and support around the Atiku candidacy. And we saw Atiku winning almost four of the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria. Atiku won in the north central part of this country. Atiku won in the southeast and the south south and took a substantial chunk of votes from the southwest. Now, this support is waning. Pandev, Ohaneze, Afeni Ferry and Co played very important role. They became partisan because of Atiku candidacy in 2019. And that gave Atiku the 11 million vote 
bank that he now claims to have, most of those votes came from the middle bed part of this country, the south-south region, the southeast, and parts of the southwest. Now, Ulysses Gopasado copied out at this time to make such a statement may not have been deliberately timed to demarcate Atiku, but it simply tells you that he's not a supporter of Atiku going to the 2023 presidential election, and that's a major support base that Atiku may have lost as well. And that is because of the sentiment, the sentiment of the need, the imperative of power shift to the South. Do not forget that some time ago it was also reported that President Ulysses Gopasado voiced out the need to shift power to the South, and possibly the Southeast. And everybody had expected the PDP to have picked their project candidate from the Southeast, not just from the Southeast, but somebody who has the popularity, who has the acceptability across the country to grace their ticket. And they didn't do that. Rather, they opted to throw it open, and then Atiku picked it. So when Ulysses Gopasado is making the same claim he's been making consistently against his vice president in the past, now the question of lack of commitment to agreements, fidelity to simple rules, begin to dog the article candidacy once more. Because again, look at it. 2023 was supposed to be a year for partial to the South. Article was the first person to pick the form going into the race ahead All right, Majid. of the resolution of the zoning committee. All right, Majid, I'm afraid that that is about all that we'll be able to take from you. It's always nice, you know, to have you join us and share perspective. We'll see how the permutations go, uh, particularly before full campaigns begin in September. So thank you so much for joining us.